How many awesome people do we know, Eric? Besides you? Um, okay, maybe five. I think I know. No, I'm going to say 50. Is that too many? It's got to be at least that many because we've had the good fortune of working with so many people over so many years because we're so goddamn old. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> it, there's some combination of I that, thought you, you were know? going to say because we're such great people but uh, or we're just well, that's, a pleasure to work there, with. There, that might work into it as well. Okay. But... Um, Okay. Isn't it funny how how some people these days th- 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 like being older is a bad thing? It's like, what's wrong with surviving? I don't get it. I know. I made a um, reference to something that wasn't even from my generation. <laughs> that was from like my mom's generation, and some younger person yeah. was like, "That's like old people stuff." And I'm like, "It's even old for me. I just because I know it doesn't make me like older. It just makes me uh, more knowledgeable." Thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> so with. The actors that we get to work with, the directors we get to work with, the producers, the musicians, all of these people are, uh, by and large, at least decent people. And some of them we've had the good fortune of becoming friends with. Yeah. And so many of them are extraordinarily talented. Mm -hmm. And I am completely hyped today to be spending some time with Mike Pollock. Yes. Who I describe as somebody who is not a friend I hang out with a lot, but I wish I did. Mm -hmm. And every time I work with him... It's like magic. Yes. And I've had the pleasure of directing Mike uh, many, many times. And um, I, I have to say that the the two of us would just get into like hysterics laughing and, and you know, like, <laughs> like, like funny. cry laughing. Um, yeah. No, extreme, <laughs> extremely funny guy. No, I'm, I'm looking forward to today's uh, uh, chat. I had the great fortune of directing him on an X-Men project and he portrayed Beast beautifully. Ooh. And... It was such a wonderful thing to to work with uh, him on because he's known for doing some more exaggerated, mm-hmm. cartoony stuff, which he does brilliantly as well. Yeah. But to dial him into that more subtle range of you know human expression and and uh, dealing with you know, that that story had a lot of dark issues going on, and he met every moment beautifully. So yeah, well you know. Uh, that's a great. That's a great thing because yet yeah, the two sides. You know what would really be nice though. Yeah, we should let him speak. Oh, actually, talk to him yeah. as opposed to talk about him. Let's bring him in. <laughs> <laughs> you are a smart guy. Let's do it. I don't want to interrupt this beautiful eulogy. That was touching. I, it's a tragic loss. That I'm no longer here, but thank you. And so kind. Well, if there's any clear indication that we should get started, let's go. Please. <laughs> Before the inevitable happens, I, <laughs> any moment, I don't know. Welcome to The Heart of the Cards, a conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what we're dealt. Hey, this is Dan Green. And Eric Stewart. And we are here with Mike Pollock. Yeah, I've heard of him. He's like in stuff. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Hello. A lot of stuff. Welcome. And this is episode 18 of The Heart of the Cards. Yeah, wel- um, welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you. Uh, I was reminded that I used to greet everyone like this. Let's see if I still can. Hi! Thank you. Little. Thank you. <laughs> you haven't lost a step. <laughs> no. You you may have added a few vocal nodes, but you haven't lost a step. Thank you so much. The gra- the gravel is much less of an affectation these days. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, people who have been listening to the Heart of the Cards know that we often use the framework of Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey as a way to prompt a conversation. And with that in mind, let's just start at the beginning. What was your the call to adventure, as Joseph Campbell put it? Meaning, what spoke to you? When did it speak to you to say, "Hey, let's be a performer. Let's try being creative with with your life." It goes back to third grade. We did a, wow. a school pageant or class pageant on Greeks or Romans or something that involved us wearing toga replicas over our clothes. And I just remember <laughs> stepping onto the stage at the elementary school, looking out at the crowd who applauded, possibly against their better judgment. And I said, I could get into this. And there were <laughs> lots of little dramatic presentations and stuff in music class. And I just, yeah, OK, I get this. I can do this. And I did. No one said to stop yet. Were you, uh, was your, your family, were there other performers? Were there other entertainers in your in, in your family to to influence you, to to give you some idea that that's something you could do for a living? Not in the direct family. Uh, my dad was in women's clothes. Oh. He, sold, he made bridal gowns. Was that at work or just <laughs> yeah. at home? Yes, professionally. He made he sold bridal gowns. <laughs> oh, very good. Okay. Uh, 
<laughs> and uh, mom, mom was a uh, lovely uh, homemaker, do we call uh-huh. it that, in those days, yep. and volunteering at hospitals and stuff. And my brother is now in publishing. But Cousin Faye, for a while, was an actor on the stage. And uh, she was, I guess, the closest familial uh, inspiration that I had. But fortunately, nobody seemed to be against it. They put me in after-school theater programs and in school theater programs and they encouraged it. They came to see the shows and they pretended to applaud. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. But but as but as Dan was saying uh in the intro to the show, um you are known for a lot of your comedic stuff and the over the top things that of course I've had the pleasure of uh ha- directing you to do. Um but uh you you have a sense of humor that is um is is it's very much your personality at least that you share with people outside of your uh home um you might be that way at home too i usually like shut down and lock myself in my room but um who was funny where what were you like wh- where did you get that your timing your you, you know i that is something to me that is a, a sign of intelligence i think that those that are incredibly funny usually are pretty smart um and i think of you as a smart guy but you also have this you just it's like it's so quick it is so quick it's a jew thing <laughs> yes <laughs> the, yeah it, it, the, some of it was dad some of it i guess a little of my brother relatives mostly mm-hmm. but also just everything i would watch and eventually when i uh, entered the world of radio as well I, I hung out with people who knew comedy and i realized oh i guess i know comedy too mm-hmm. um <laughs> You had it was by osmosis, yes. in, a, in a sense. We can bleep yeah. this, but I remember the first joke I wrote myself in conversation. Uh-huh. Um, there was apparently some news article. I'm guessing I was in grade school about uh, human feces found in chocolate chip ice cream, and uh, my brain suddenly said, "Oh, so it was like chocolate shit ice cream." Yeah. <laughs> hey, I made a joke. Look at me. And that's that. I, I thought you were going to say it was Reese's feces. It could have but, been that too. Okay, that's good. Very good. I, <laughs> so and, uh, yeah, so go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so that's I said. Oh, I can make these jokes and so yeah. So the, so the that that explains a little bit of the humor stuff, um, which is great. Uh, but you did mention the radio thing. Um, I don't want to jump too many uh, chapters in your life ahead, but because um, you didn't go from third grade to radio, but you might have. Um, <laughs> tell me a, a little bit about that or or how that evolved because that's kind of the first thing I remember you sharing with me as part of your background. It was a lot of listening first. Um, mm. There was a radio. We had this AM, FM radio device, very technologically advanced. Mm-hmm. That was, <laughs> there was the classic New York radio, 77 WABC and uh, stuff. And, I, and, and the music was fine, but I realized that there was entertainment available on the radio beyond music. I stumbled upon some old time radio broadcasts. Um, mm. There was a local call in quiz show, which was actually my entree into. Uh, into the, the actual world of radio. In high school, we had a high school radio program at the local college at CW Post. And I applied for that, and I got to get out of school for a couple hours a week and go play on the radio. Mm-hmm. And then I simultaneously started calling in to a call-in quiz show on another college radio station called The Game Show, where uh, they would subtle, ask— Subtle, very subtle name. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, Descend into a, a much better, <laughs> much better, well-known show, and much better show overall called Mouth versus Ear with Dick Summer. Old people might remember that. It's not important if you don't. Right. But um, the key thing about that show is you would call in and ask the panel a question, and it could be a real question or what they would call a hoister, which is a riddle, and they would try to guess it, and then they would ask you a question. And uh, you would try to guess it, and the, they would score, score points the mouth versus ear in the original uh, title or the, the panel versus the listeners. And eventually, that show got kicked off the air, and I said, hey, I'm involved with another radio station. Pardon me. Would you like to be on this radio station? Let me see what I can set up. And the college radio station I was working with said, sure, we'll take a chance. So I got the show back on the air, and they let wow. me be part of the panel of um, for uh, for the show, I was actually the and engineer. You're how, you're how old at that point? Um, it was late high school, junior, senior. Wow. Um, 
And then the world's... That's a lot of initiative for that age. It was, but I, I loved the show and I wanted to, to continue. And they were nice <laughs> enough to let me be a part of it. Kind of. I was also mostly the engineer and they didn't get have a microphone available. So I had to <laughs> come through the window, to in, through the door to actually insert myself into the program. But that's when worlds started to collide because over the summer... I would normally be in our lovely Poconos vacation home with mom and dad and away from this show. But there was a summer theater program at this college as well. So I said, mm. well, you know, if you'll put me in the com- in the summer theater program, I can work on the show every week. Mm. So they did. I did my summer theater. Um, we did the show on the weekends. The show was subsequently canceled during that summer, again, for good. But at least I got to do radio and theater. And then ultimately, the worlds collided with voiceover acting and voice acting, which is basically old-time radio drama with pictures. Yeah. So, so when you were doing, wow. so when you were doing uh, the, the the show, the the, uh, the the onstage performance, was it musical theater? Was it straight plays? What what was what was your your calling? Because I I know you're also musical. So was mm-hmm. that was that what you were drawn to as well? Yeah, there are our schools, the actual schools, not the college, but high school did a musical and a straight show or two. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd be part of those as well if they would have me. Um, junior high before that, I don't think we got into musicals, but I did a straight play or two. I was actually more on the technical side of things, not realizing what I wanted to do. So I, I was keyed up mm. to do the lighting on the old school yeah. switchboard <laughs> lighting booth where the flames would wow. shoot out if you put the plugs in wrong. Um, but then high school became more performing and less tech. And that uh, went through to college, didn't major in theater, um, decided between theater and radio, radio a little more um, stable with work, not by much. Uh, but also Syracuse University had a the Syracuse University musical stage, which would take anyone because the theater department wouldn't let you minor in theater. <laughs> no, you can't minor in theater, please. But they, oh, they, there was a side group that took anybody and I was involved in that. And also at that time, I got an internship at the local radio station. So both wow. passions stayed alive. Yeah. Even while, well, while, as, as, as the uh, honorary goy in this conversation, I can't help but uh, observe that your story uh, portrays three flattering Jewish stereotypes, humor, <laughs> negotiating, and show business. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Wait, the, we're in the show Trump business? The true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no, but that's, fa- that's fascinating because, I, you know, I... I, I knew you knew a lot of the technical side as well because you had been doing this yeah. stuff in, in radio. And um, I think that it's interesting that you started, uh, as we would say, behind the glass uh, and then went to the other end of it and then really wanted to be more involved in the performing side. Of course, now uh, you you focus on being on the other side of the glass, still in a box, but not in the control room as much as in the in the in the vocal booth. But it is interesting that you made that shift. Um, one of the things I like to ask anyone who does any performing outside of um, our little safe area in in our four walls here with our microphones, um, and when you get up on stage in front of that live audience, um, what do you do with uh, your your do you get stage fright? Do you get nerves? Do you get, is there something that you, uh, a mantra you have, like, or do you really just go, I, I got this, no big deal. I think a lot of our listeners also learn a lot from our different ways of dealing with that because some of them are, oh, I'm afraid to even try that or whatever. Um, and you and presume that we are never that way. Yes. Yeah. And so we've shared our own versions of how we deal with that. I'm just curious because you went from behind the scenes to, uh, you know, in front of the audience. Um, and that transition was probably a completely different dynamic. I think there's only been one bout of stage fright and it was just a one time transient thing. But no, usually as long as I'm prepared, <laughs> which, <laughs> you know, um, but no, I, I, I am comfortable in front of an audience, both an audience miles away and many minutes away if it's something pre-recorded mm-hmm. or a live audience. I will be – this is not – this possibly should be embargoed, so I'll be vague. I will be returning to the stage um, for the first time in over a decade wow. in an off-Broadway off production, uh, which uh, – Good for you. It's been publicized, thank you. Once it's been publicized, I can say more. Was going to be on stage last year in a uh, local theater production – 
Should I shame it? Oh, I will. Um, <clears throat> the local Gilbert and Sullivan Society, um, who wow. my, my wife loves Gilbert and Sullivan, I tolerate Gilbert and Sullivan, didn't realize there was a local society until we were out for lunch and saw their van parked in a parking lot. And it turns out mm. they don't own the van anymore, but somebody bought the van, didn't rip the branding off. And I said, look, there's a local thing. We should look into it. We did. They were holding auditions. We went. We auditioned. I booked a major role as the major general. My wife, not so much. Oh, wow. Um, and we went to be part of it. They said, well, <laughs> she, if you're going to She didn't the- get the role, but the person who doesn't like Gilbert and Sullivan so much did. <laughs> she she got the understudy thing for the role, which oh, well, she was that's not great. thrilled about. That's it great. was. It actually has a happier ending because they say, well, if you're going to be in the show, you have to be in this concert that we're doing. Hmm. So we went to these uh. concert rehearsals, still in the tail end of lockdown. The music director showed up. <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, no. Days later, oh, no. hello, everyone. We had a po- tested positive COVID thing. Yes. You should get yourself checked. Yeah. And we looked at each other and said, we don't want to be a part of this. Mind if we just <laughs> step out? And we just <laughs> kind of backed out. Went to see the show. Could have been better with us, but it was fine without us. Um, so, but I will actually be returning to an off-Broadway stage. By request, I was actually sought out. And uh, that's going to be very cool. When it happens, I'll let you know. So I'm impressed. I, you know, I, I must say... You know, I, I'm not surprised by your answer, but um, in terms of the performers we have spoken with and 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 and, and the stories that we've shared, um, that you you strut out on that stage with that confidence is great. I think that's fantastic. I mean, to be able to just say uh-huh. I've I've done the work, I've I've prepared for the role, um, I'm here to do it, and um, and that's great. And also that. You know, probably means that if things don't go great on that stage, you are in a place where you can bring it back to where it's supposed to be without, you know, having a breakdown there. And that's and that's great. I, I'm I'm impressed. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I will not say I am not nervous about all the memorization, which is a skill I have. I'm sure I still have, but I haven't used in a while. Mm-hmm. There's going to be a lot mm-hmm. of dialogue and I'm going to yeah. work on that. Great. And I'm trying to remember, how did I used to do this when I did this? Right. How did I remember all of those lines, all of yeah. those times? And, and preparation is the, is the word that you used. That's the qualifier for you feeling like you can confidently own that space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Beyond memorization, what do you feel you really need to have to hold and be that character? Some common experience, if possible. Um, mm. This guy Which explains is, Eggman. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I've, I have grown into that part, he said, slapping... Oh, I hurt myself slapping my own belly. Um, the resemblance was not intentional, but... Oh, hey, yeah, now. There's that. Um, and he's also become just old and crotchety, and so have I, so that, that works out very well. <laughs> Life imitating um, art, I love it. But, ex- but yeah, exactly. but you have to identify with the character on some level. You have to be able to be empathetic to their perspective on some level, right? Yeah, and and even if you don't, I I've played total opposites, mm-hmm. um, and and that's a challenge in itself. But it helps to have something in common. This is a New York guy, so I'll be playing the New York mm-hmm. aspect of it, right? And it, it should come easily. And, and there's enough comedy and drama in the piece that I was able to say, oh, I could do that. I could. Oh, I could definitely do this. This will be nice. So here's here's a question that actors often get asked: Do you have a preference between drama and comedy? I love to laugh, but I love right. the challenge of tearing at heartstrings. I've done right. more dramatic stuff lately, and it satisfies me. It, it, right. it, I hate to try and be detached and, and observe my own performance, but I listen back or listen to what I'm doing and say, oh, that was good. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and plus, so, I've, yeah, I've said that, that to those of us who do so much comedy and most comedians have such a dark... <laughs> undercurrent that's in our lives that it's it's almost easy to to play the darker stuff because yeah. you know the, the so much of the comedy is used to mask and 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 build that shield um to protect ourselves so when we are asked to do something that you wouldn't expect from us um it's like you know some of the greatest comedians i mean i i i think immediately of robin williams um you yeah, know so, yeah. you know it's like you know, one of the funniest men ever, and one of, of course, you know, having you know such 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 a struggle. You know, um, one of my favorite you know people of all time, and yet I got I understood when he played 
those serious roles um, mm-hmm. because it almost seemed effortless as if he was being more of himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, and, and comedy at its very inception is a critique. Yes. It's a complaint of, of some sort, whether it's a deeply tragic one or not. But yeah, comedians are often citing those things yes. that we all have issues with. Right. <laughs> Fiction relies on the element of surprise and whether the surprise comes from within the piece or the fact that I'm doing drama that nobody has ever heard me do before. It's like, thank you. Mike well, really can act. Yes, he can. Thank you. Yes, Sorry. yes you can. <clears throat> and I, I remember when casting the Astonishing X-Men project, the motion comic for Marvel, that was over 10 years ago now. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember some people when I said, yeah, we got Mike Pollock as Beast. And they were like, Mike? And I'm like, yeah. And I always, I never th- doubted that you could do that. But I think for a lot of people, it was, surpri- it was a surprise that you had those layers. Wait, are you yeah. saying that we were typecast in some of our roles? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, here and there. <laughs> I might have been given a heroic role too often. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe people thought I didn't have a sense of humor. Oh, I know you mean Hudson <clears throat> Horstachio from the great Viva Piñata. I know, I know. Well, yeah, you had to champion that. Wow. But Mike, you were such a great beast. Uh, what was that project like for you? It was a learning experience in the in the greatest way. I don't. I should be better versed in pop culture, but since I was kicked out of radio, and it's a story that we should probably get to at some <laughs> point, um, I don't have to be following pop culture for a job. Right. So I didn't right. know enough about X Men as some. Definitely not as right. much as you, Dan. Um, but that was you, my job. My job was. That you didn't have to know anything. Exactly. Right? That I, I love telling people, the director knows if I sound like I know what I'm doing, and if I don't, <laughs> they'll let That's me right. know. So, yes, That's you right. guided me and said, well, here's what we're looking for. With um, Kelsey Grammer as Frasier came up as a reference, and I said, okay, I've done that before. And right. um, it was great You exploring the different medium, the motion comic aspect, which you were extremely excited about, and I couldn't help but, yeah. but catch that from you. And it was a wonderful thing. I, I saw the uh, the finished result and said, oh, this is cool. I like this. Yeah, it, it was. And then you also did a, a great character, a dramatic turn in Crossing the Gods, which, of course, has yet to come out. Um, also, somewhat. Yes. <laughs> yes, you give me crap about that as well. You should. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you portray uh, Greg Abbey's father in that. And there's uh, a tension between them that is well earned. Um, but, uh, yeah, I... I, I, I say this all the time. I just wish we could get the visuals done because everybody in that cast sounds great. Um, they'll get done, really man. Really don't computer. don't don't worry. You you know you, they'll get done. You're doing them. <laughs> you're doing them as a one man team with the the creation of that. So don't give yourself a hard time about that. And, but and this it, is not about me. This is about Mike. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. But but yes, uh, Mike. Another th- another thing as a as a fellow geek, and I know that you geek about certain things. Sure. Um, you had the privilege of. Recording, I believe, an interview with Leonard Nimoy. Um, yeah, kind of. It was a press event, um, and uh-huh. I was I was seated in the crowd of reporters. And as it happened, my um, journalism one of my journalism professors was also a photographer for the local paper. So he captured me in a nice photographic uh, montage, a collage of me and uh, and Leonard by angling just the right way. But yeah, I, that's I, what I'm, I'm remembering. It's a black and white photo. Right? Yeah, and and yeah. I'm trying to remember if I had a. Uh, any scintillating questions for that interview? I did not. I had a lovely chat with Robert Klein in a different event where we had a, a, a delightful bantery exchange. A very yeah, funny yeah, man, too. Just, yes. <laughs> yes. Very funny. He, he was but, very funny. Yes, I was part of the uh, press pool, such as it was, in that event, and, and I got captured in the shot. Very Delightfully cool. grainy Good. image, such as it is. I was going <laughs> to say, I just saw recently... And uh, speaking of another one of uh, your roles that you did that, of course, is one of my favorites, um, I see that they're releasing the entire... See all seasons of Ultimate Muscle, where you played the <laughs> Ultimate where, Muscle, where you played the amazing meat. Yes, but the whole yes. the whole series is coming out. That's delightful. Nice of us. To, nice of them to tell us. Well, yeah. I mean, I saw <laughs> I saw the tweet about it, and everyone's sharing the the box set or whatever it is. It's like seventy seven mm. episodes. I'm like, uh, could I get like a tag on that or something? Since I did direct 
the show for a long time, at least the first three seasons. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, and whatever. I have some of the original VHS or DVD releases yeah. that they did. But yeah, this is going to be, this is a spectacular thing. Well, I'm not to one. make this interview about me, but I'm going to make this about me for one moment. Please. Um, so uh, one of the characters I played on that show, uh, people always ask me about the name. Um, of course, I played Dick Dick Van Dick, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> Which, not as suggestive as you might think. No, is. no, no. And here's why. So, so first of all, I wanted him to be somewhere between Charlton Heston and 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 uh, and um, and William Shatner. I wanted him to have that kind of broken phrasing. So, um, so, so ego on top of ego. exactly, and that's what really fit with this. And so, when we were doing uh, when we do shows like that that are that are uh, you know. Uh, produced in another country and we bring them over we have to come up with you know the Ameri- you know the english uh, names for these characters and some of them have already had uh, trademarks on them you know so this thing was a gazelle he was you know and gazelle man was already taken and so i'm doing the research and looking up different forms of you know different types of gazelles and i and i come across a dick dick right mm-hmm. and i'm like oh this is great and so i went to our um main producer who ran the entire uh, production facility, Norman Grossfeld. And I said, hey, Norman, so I came up with a name for this character in the show. Um, I, let's what do you think of Dick Dick Van Dyke? And he said, Eric, if we're going to call him Dick Dick, we're going to call him Dick Dick Van Dick. <laughs> and I'm like, that's fantastic. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. So I'm, I'm so glad that now that's been pressed into a, a, a DVD set for, for eternity. The great Dick Dick Van Dick. <laughs> a, be- a beautiful story. A beautiful story. But, but so Mike, for meat, when I would, I did incidental characters, as did I think nearly every male actor yes. uh, that four kids knew. Um, because there's just so many characters being pumped through that show. But uh, I was in awe of how much vocal power you were able to consistently give while also contributing a nuance. So it wasn't just yelling to that character. Yeah. Were those sessions exhausting? For those who don't know the show and don't know what meat looked like, I'm going to give you the visual. Think of a small old baby in a diaper. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. I, I will take you back to the audition process. Eric was there. Yes, do, please. please. Um, as I found out later, th- this was early in the anime career, and I realized um, the, the first few shows I was in when the internet was in its nascent fra- phase, you could go online and do research. And I realized that was a bad thing because the Japanese voice of me was a was a very high pitched female, which is not what they were looking for. The character was completely different. Um, and Eric brought me in, bless his heart, and said, "We don't know what we're looking for, but maybe it's a truck driver." Wheels started turning in my head. I said, Hah! "This this uh, every truck driver voice I'd ever known coalesced in my head." And I said, "All right, let's try this." And I I did a few reads like that, and. It was much loved, apparently, by the production team. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hilarious. And I I had never realized that being loud and gravelly was going to be a thing, but this was the first real use of one, and it has become, mm-hmm. I guess, a trademark on a variety of Well, characters. there's elements of that in Eggman, uh, uh, to a degree. Absolutely. Right? There's Eggman, yeah. there's a Bonaparte on, G, on Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. which was basically meat, but a bit more effeminate. Mm-hmm. Started as Harvey mm-hmm. Firestein, didn't end as Harvey Firestein. Um, but... <laughs> I was able to figure out that there was comedy in there and there was I was able to to overplay it sometimes and underplay it surprising mm-hmm. myself but once I figured out even with most most character voices the first few episodes sound different yes so if you listen yes. to the first few episodes of yes. Vol- of, of ultimate muscle it's very one dimensional but as the series progressed he softened up at times. Um, he got his little trademark mm-hmm. phrase. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, yeah, it, it wasn't as painful. Um, and, it, it, <laughs> and my otolaryngologist, the ear, nose, throat guy for you <laughs> private citizens, he said uh, on a recent visit, you haven't done any damage. I guess you're doing something right. Well, that brings so, up an interesting thing I want to ask you because you are using a sound 
in your voice that would appear like it is doing damage, that it is hard to maintain that without losing your voice. You know, as a rock singer, I have my tricks where it sounds like I'm, you know, singing loud or whatever, but I'm not hurting myself. Um, So I'm wondering, do you, what are your tips to keep yourself, to keep your voice in good form when you are doing that stuff? Um, Do you have, uh, you know, oh, I have my tea and I have my singer saving grace and I have my this and that, or like, no, I just drink a lot of coffee and scotch. Like what is the, um, you know, what, what do you find is your way to maintain that so that you are not doing any damage? I should do a better job of repairing, <laughs> but I don't. You mean like I, warming up? Yeah, warming up should happen more. Hydration. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, uh, the challenge now is I'm older and a, is a late in life Invisalign uh, user. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't drink much when I'm wearing these stupid trays. Uh-huh. It has to be clear, clear water. I've now found some fruit flavored uh, waters that I can have that the dentist says is okay. But in the old days, it was I would travel with a bottle of. Uh, of cold brew tea. Mm -hmm. I would put the tea in the bottle and then I would uh, leave uh, work when I was moonlighting uh, for four kids. And by the time I got to the uh, studio to record, there was tea on my uh, my belt, hanging from my belt in the bottle. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes there would be an an iced Americano from Starbucks. None of these are advised by professionals, but too bad No, they're not. Anything (laughs) with caffeine dehydrates you. Exactly. Right. And then when I was done, there'd be lozenges. I would always travel with uh, Mm -hmm. Thayer's lozenges recently discontinued and now... uh, Ludens are my uh, are my new favorite. So yeah, mm-hmm. lozenges and just vocal rest. And I fondly recall. Um, here's a story. I, we I've not directly addressed this with Dan, but I'll bring it up now. There was a mm. uh, period for about two months when I had laryngitis because I was stupid. I'd had laryngitis before, and I figured well, this will last for a week or two. This is nothing. And then by the second month or so, I figured maybe I should see a doctor. And I did. Wow. I went to uh, to the ENT and got steroid pills. And within minutes of popping the first pill, my voice was coming back. And I said, wow, where the heck has this been? This is brilliant. Mm-hmm. But I recall during um, an episode or two of Sonic X, when uh, Dr. Eggman would have his stereotypical, oh, ho, 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 voice, and I was not yeah. capable of that, uh, uh. the one Dan Green was hired as a stunt laugher for me. I was oh, not, did I do that? Oh my! I God. was not told this, but I heard uh, I, as was watching the episode as it aired, and I said, "That's not me. That's Dan." <laughs> okay, I'm cool with that. There are worse choices they could have had. Wow, that's but yes. I, I forgot that I did that. Well, yes. I mean, we all had. I'm flattered. I'm flattered that I could contribute to your creation of Eggman. If yeah. I sure. can, if I can count the amount of times we've all been asked to, oh my goodness, so and so's away for like three weeks, and we need to say this one word. Can you right you, and be like, right. yes, yes, I can. Which also, just as a little side note, for all of these people that think that they are irreplaceable, they're not. <laughs> so so be grateful <laughs> be grateful of the work you do and 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 uh yes because you know the minute you start thinking like oh come on I'm the only guy that can do this well no actually that's not true if you read the contract so, it's specified that sound alikes are permitted you <laughs> signed it All right 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 oh i'm supposed to read those contracts right um so there's this <laughs> what contract? there's this <laughs> there's this area between your early life, and and you described uh, Ultimate Muscle as you were new to the anime stuff. Mm-hmm. So what's your creative life like just before you started doing the work that people have come to know you for? The bulk of the early work was radio. Uh, started mm-hmm. on a field trip from college. We went to a local radio station, and uh, they were looking for interns. And everyone was saying, well, I want to be an intern on the air. I want to be a DJ. And I, I went to the production guy, the guy who makes the commercials happen and makes that sort of stuff come to life. Mm-hmm. And I said, are you looking for an intern? I said, well, we weren't before, but I guess we can be now. Pick me, pick me. And he did. My first <laughs> job was uh, sitting in front of a typewriter with index cards cataloging the record library. Old 45s. I love that. To be Three Thank old you. man references in a row. I feel at home. Yes. I wound up the Victrola. Um, and so I, I actually... I and sent a carrier pigeon. And sent, was, yeah, and sent a carrier pigeon. My wire pigeon recorder. To, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was hard at work typing index cards, and I finished the record library. And the production guy said, well, now what do we do with you? I don't know. Uh, 
I like, guess yeah, here, come learn to make commercials and we'll put you on the air. So I was a part time air personality on Y94 FM in Syracuse and the AM side, WSYR, actually talking to people during the day. Uh, the other stuff was often overnights. Mm-hmm. Um, then I was uh, part time for far too long, found a full time job in Rochester, New York as a production director. Uh, mm-hmm. realized uh, after a year when I was fired for being not rock and roll enough. Oh, boy. Which is a reason you can be fired wait, in wait, radio. Wait, wait. Has anyone seen your shirts? Well, no, not at the time. Okay. I Mike, was, Mike this, has fantastically out there shirts that I think are you. part of your trademark as well. Yes. My, my personal appearance wardrobe are now satin shirts. There's a story behind that, <laughs> yes. too, when we get to it. Um, <laughs> And so kicked out of that radio station. Uh, I was kicked out of the previous radio station, too, for uh, pulling an all-nighter on the overnight shift and then covering from the production uh, director in the morning. And one of the local car dealer guys came in to do his his radio commercials and I was engineering that and I was I was toast I was like I I can't which is the press record I can't I'm sorry I'm so asleep and that got back to my program director who thought that I was being uh, sassy to this car dealer guy and suspended me for a couple of months and until he realized that when the car dealer came back and said no he's just tired oh uh, would you like to come back to work now yes I would thank you very much Um, so there was there uh, in Rochester for a year kicked out of Rochester and then I was uh, in a New York syndication company for almost 15 years Uh, started there in the bowels of the operation duplicating tapes to send out uh, back before digital Mm -hmm. distribution was a thing but I ran the tape duplication machine but I was also surrounded by people writing comedy, and they said, you know, if you want to, go ahead. So I started writing comedy bits. I became the head song parody writer, banging out over a thousand song parody titles to my name. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. Most, most, thank you very much. Most of which were short, little little show opens and stuff, but parodying, uh, parodying popular songs or oldies, and then all the mm-hmm. topical stuff we did. So I have a... Big back catalog of now. Do Michael you play Jackson, an instrument? Do you play an instrument besides doing the singing stuff? Do you do you actually play? Not recognizably. There were drum lessons <laughs> and guitar lessons. I can find my way around the drum set if I had to. If <laughs> if wow. every other drumer well, uh, uh, um, died in a bizarre gardening accident, timing. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, guys, this is such a fervent conversation, and I hate to do this, but we're going to have to break this up into two parts for our okay. listeners. So. Th- we got a, a fair amount about the beginnings of Mike Pollock, not the late and great Mike Pollock. He was joking about that. He's still with us. Um, but what I think we should do is, yeah, bring this part of the conversation to a close for this first part of episode 18. And then we will continue with part two on next week. What do you guys think about that? Perfect. Sounds good. Excellent. All right. So thank you, Eric. And thank you, Mike, for being a part of the heart of the cards today. And thank you to our listeners who are there for us every week. And we'll look forward to the next time we can have a conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what you're dealt. Thanks for listening to The Heart of the Cards with Dan Green and Eric Stewart. We hope this conversation in some way spoke to you. Whatever your journey, we look forward to crossing paths again in the next episode. This is Veronica Taylor, and on behalf of Adromeda Productions, we wish you well. Audromeda, always a sound choice.